Good morning, church. I greet you and remind you that God's grace and peace are yours this day and forevermore. If you'll stand with me, let's share together in our call to worship. There is a season for everything and a time for every matter under the heavens, a time for giving birth and a time for dying, a time for planting and a time for uprooting what is planted. Now is the time for worship. So we share together in great is thy faithfulness as we begin our worship. Please be seated. Our opening scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. It is a reading that uh, at a time in the midst of Jesus' ministry, um, uh, we hear actually a whole series of teachings, uh, kind of all together uh, in this 12th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, uh, that talks about um, you know, encouraging the disciples to be ready, <laughs> to be ready. Um, and to be ready means um, getting your sleep at night and not worrying. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. There is more to life than food and more to the body than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither plant nor harvest. They have no silo or barn. Yet, yet God feeds them. You are worth so much more than the birds. Who among you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? If you can't do such a small thing, why worry about the rest? Notice how the lilies grow. They don't wear themselves out with work, and and they don't spin cloth. But I say to you that even Solomon, in all his splendor, wasn't dressed like one of these If God dresses grass in the field so beautifully, even though it's alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will God do for you, you people of weak faith? Don't chase after what you will eat or what you will drink. Stop worrying. All the nations of the world long for these things. Your Father knows that you need them. Instead, desire His kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Kind hands doing good to all, healing pain and sickness, blessing children small, washing tired feet and saving those 
Invite us then to uh, lift up all these matters to God as we pray, but not giving just uh, out of our worries or praises out of our hearts, but giving also out of uh, our very lives as we make our gifts of tithes and offerings to God. So let's stand and praise God together, shall we? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Gracious Lord, as we stand before your table this day, we make our offerings to you, um, giving you, Lord, uh, both the joys and the concerns that we carry so that we don't have to carry them, but, Lord, in its place, uh, have just simply pure joy. Uh, we also make tithes and offerings, Lord, also part of our joy, for out of the abundance that you first give to you, we return uh, that which we can so that, Lord, others too, uh, in near places and far, might be served uh, by our lives. Lord, in offering all these things, we do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, please see. Our next scripture reading is just actually two verses from um, the third chapter of Ecclesiastes. Um, they may be a little bit uh, lesser known than the first uh, few verses, uh, which we hear oftentimes like at funerals. Um, uh, but, uh, but I turn to verse 14 and 15 in some ways is a, maybe a bit of a summary, not just a, about the poetic parts of uh, this chapter of Ecclesiastes, but a bit of a summary, maybe, about the whole writing itself. I know that whatever God does will last forever. It's impossible to add to it or take away from it. God has done this so that people are reverent before God. Whatever happens has already happened, and whatever will happen has already happened before. And God looks after what is driven away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn this morning, O God, our help in ages past. Just sing, if you will, from where you're seated. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shall from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne still may we dwell secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone and our defense is sure. Before the Brothers and sisters, I, I begin this morning just by offering a word of confession. <laughs> they say it's good for your soul, right? Um, lost a little bit of sleep last night. You know, uh, we had a funeral at St. Paul Church yesterday. Uh, formerly very, very active uh, church member, uh, Leah, Leah Smith, who was a school teacher for Wayne Trace for many, many years. Uh, actually was inducted in their Hall of Fame just this last year. Um, but at age 90, uh, died, and, and as the family was there, and we had just started the funeral service, 
And, um, and, and over there, I, I know from time to time the, the sound system would be a little bit staticky. <laughs> and usually I just stop talking because <laughs> oftentimes this uh, microphone that I wear would be the culprit. And then the static would go away and I would just proceed. Well, I did that a couple of times as we started the funeral. And then to my horror, <laughs> that it just went, <laughs> you know, really loud <laughs> and just stayed that way. And so I'm panicky. I'm grabbing the transmitter and I'm, sh you know, putting it on mute. That didn't do anything. And then I'm shutting the power off. That didn't do anything. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I head back to the soundboard and I'm thinking, oh, which channel is it? I don't know if I remember in my mind which one to, you know, which button to push. Because if you looked over the edge back here, those soundboards have like a thousand switches on them. And I thought, well, I could go see if I can just start pulling wires. And I thought, no, I'm just hit the kill switch. Boom. Of course, that shut everything off. Poor Dave. Uh, Dave Snyder, I don't, some of you, I hope you were praying for, for Dave. Um, this summer, he's had a horrible, horrible summer. He's, he's had sciatic nerve issues and, and a leg that has gone almost limp because of the severity of the pinched nerve, but they can't yet locate it, so they don't know what to do about it. And, and in the process, he's had to go from playing the organ because if you ever watch Alice, uh, it's not just your hands are going, your feet too, right? You're pumping some of those pedals. Well, his leg won't move. <laughs> so, so he's gone from that to playing the keyboard. Well, when I hit the power switch, what do you suppose I turned off? Because <laughs> the keyboard's electric too. And so in the night, I'm thinking, you know, because after, after most everybody was gone from the funeral, I, I horsed around a bit, and Dave was there, so I had him get back on the keyboard so we could plug it back in and see if we could make sure we could at least get it working. And, uh, and then I went back to work on the, on the rest of the sound system and found another channel, <laughs> took some duct tape and covered over the other one, and, uh, and found another channel where at least my, my voice would work again yesterday. But then last night, I'm thinking, oh, is that going to do that again this morning? Now, sometimes when this happens, when these little things happen, it, it really, you know, in the scope of life, it is really just a little thing, isn't it? But sometimes when these little things happen, we, we lose sleep over it. And, and in fact, sometimes when Joanne and I get up in the morning, you know, we'll ask each other, well, how'd you sleep? Well, how'd you sleep? Well, I heard the, the, the clock in the dining room chime three times. Well, I heard it chime three times too. Oh, well, I still heard it chimes four, as if we're competing with each other, right? When the whole idea is we ought to be getting our sleep and not worrying. But we do anyway. What's with that? Now, you realize Jesus' teaching, right? <laughs> How many times, <laughs> in fact, I just read a very short piece of, uh, of this series of teachings in chapter 12 of the gospel in which several times he comes across, and, and even in the, in the contemporary English uh, version, as I read, you know, at one point, you know, there it is, two words, stop worrying, period. Well, how do you do that? <laughs> how do you go to bed at night and not worry? How do you have family issues and not worry? How do you have health issues and not worry? How does something happen in the community like the suicides and you not worry? How do we do that? So what really is Jesus talking about? Well, I suspect, kind of taking a step back from all of this, he's aware like we're aware that when we start worrying, we miss out on things that could be because we're still focused on things that were. So, so I know there is at least that dynamic going on, right? That, that if we're so worried about the little things, as Jesus says, you know, if you're so worried about the little things and you can't change them, <laughs> then what are you going to do when the big things come along, when the real major things come along? Are we still going to worry? And, and worry has this funny way of taking the joy out of life, doesn't it? Because all the while, <laughs> last night, as I'm, you know, in the middle of the night thinking about, well, okay, did I check this uh, chord? Did I, did I change that setting? You know, trying to get things ready for today so everything would be just right again this morning. As I'm picturing this in my mind, going over it again and again, for heaven's sake, the soundboard was ten and a half miles away. <laughs> what good was it going to do by changing things up here? Right? And it's just a little thing after all. So you know what happened, don't you? 
I got to church this morning, and the sound worked perfectly all the way through. But don't you know, when I got there, there was another computer screen that was blued out uh, saying that the operating system had failed on this computer. <laughs> so we didn't have any, anything on the screens this morning, and suddenly it's like, oh, oh, part of the liturgy is not written down anywhere. <laughs> but anyway, so we had to shift gears quick, and I was just discombobulated all the way through church. Not because of the sound, not because of what I worried about, but because of something new, something unforeseen. <laughs> Although that's foreseen as well. We talked a couple of years ago already about how the computers were aging around the, both that facility and this facility. But Jesus is, Jesus is just really, really clear, isn't it? And he tells us that in the scripture. Don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, about what your body, what you're going to wear. Now, now, he's talking to you and me, right? He's not talking to the poor folks here. They need to worry, Right? They need to figure out, uh, you know, when they're on one meal a day, they need to figure out where that next one's going to come from. You know, their bodies are just hanging on. And when their clothing are just bare threads and the season changes and becomes, you know, detrimental to us, yeah, they need to be worrying. But this message is not for them. It's for us. Uh, we have, uh, what do we call them at home? These, these, these wooden structures that surround our kitchens. We have cupboards. And if your cupboards are like my cupboards, man, I could quit going to the grocery store and eat for six months. Anybody else like me? <laughs> right? I don't think I'm a pack rat until I open one of those little doors. You get it on sale, let's get 600 of them, right? Look at all the money we're saving. But who are we going to feed? So Jesus is very clear. He's speaking to us ordinary folks who tend to plan ahead. You tend to worry and plan ahead. And God's given this wonderful gift of being able to do that. Now, don't get me wrong. It's good that we should somehow have these gifts of looking ahead in life, of being able to chart things out on calendars. But when things don't go well, then what? So don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, or about your body, what you'll wear. Uh, and, of course, the, the reality. <laughs> don't chase after what what you'll eat or drink, and, and, and just that phrase, just stop. <laughs> stop. Stop worrying. There it is. Stop worrying. And then comes this response. I don't know if you caught it the first time. Instead, in place of worry, right? What are we going to do? Desire his kingdom. Desire God's kingdom. And these things will be given to you as well. Now, remember, I suggested last week already, you know, kind of leading up to this, you know, so oftentimes teaching, one teaching leads to another, uh, is that sometimes when we put our faith in action, when we put our faith to work, when we start, when we start being proactive, so to speak, and, and instead of doing the pity parties on ourselves, oh, this didn't go right, that didn't go right, when we put our faith in action and just go to work and serve somebody else, boy, you know, time passes and we realize, well, gosh, we got through that. And especially when we've served somebody else during our hardship, we discover that, wow, there's a joy there somehow. That's part of what it means to desire God's kingdom. Isn't it your dream, like it's my dream, that there shouldn't be anybody who has to worry about food, that there shouldn't be anybody who has to worry about clothing, shelter, or every, anything of the, of the sort? Isn't it your dream, like my dream, that part of what it means to anticipate God's kingdom coming in its fullness is that everything will be right, including the fact that everyone will have what they need in life to be able to be fulfilled in God's joy. I long for that. And then I have to stop and, and just kind of scratch my head and think to myself, but, but what does this really look like and, and, and more than that, when Jesus is teaching this, from his perspective, what does it look like? I mean, think about this. Jesus is teaching, don't worry. And yet the whole while he's in ministry, oh, he hears the rumors, right? He, he, he is driven out of one village and then another, right? At one point, even in his hometown, they took him to the edge of town as if they you know, could throw him over the cliff. Let's do away with this guy. So the whole time he's teaching, don't worry, 
don't you suppose he's anticipating the suffering that may come in his life? The kind of death that he will have? How did he do it? How, how in the world, if he managed, okay, okay, if he managed to not worry about the little things, what about those things? How did he do that? Well, my thought is, is the answer is right here. His desire to serve God, his desire for God's kingdom to come in everything, everywhere, through every word from our mouths, through every action from our hands. Maybe that's how it happens, that we don't worry, is we focus on God's kingdom, God's kingdom that is yet coming. Now, early Christians, I know, tried to do this, right? Um, well, Christians of every age have, really, but often times in Christian history lessons, uh, we're told of the age of martyrdom, <laughs> the age of martyrdom. Maybe you've heard this in a Sunday school lesson, right? Because uh, we know there was a time uh, shortly after uh, the period of the disciples uh, when you know, we, for sure by then, had the written gospels, the written letters of Paul, and, and different uh, communities, Christian communities, beginning to assemble all those writings. Eventually, they're made into a Bible. But for those early Christians, it, it soon became their experience that they could not do this. They could not worship legally, right? They had to go underground. They had to hide what they were doing. They had to worry whether on their way to the secret location would some guard somewhere see them and recognize, oh, aren't they one of those folk? And then secretly follow them to the gathering place. And next thing you know, there's several households that have been arrested this week. And you know what happened when they were arrested. We hear about this age of martyrdom. They were killed for their faith. How did they do it? And yet, uh, truth is uh, that even today, Christians everywhere, um, Christians everywhere are persecuted and killed for their faith. When we turn to, uh, when we turn to the Ecclesiastes passage, um, it's very clear that, uh, you know, the subtle message of Ecclesiastes, and yet not so subtle, is that we just don't control life at all. Whatever happens has already happened, and whatever will happen has already happened before. <laughs> yeah, you know, c'est la vie, as the French would say. What goes around comes around. Uh, you know, we have all the bumper stickers to go with this truth, that we can't change life in the way that God has made it. We can only live it. And yet, there's good news in this, right? Because part of what has already happened is God's made a way. Part of what has happened before and what will happen again is God has pushed in us into the future. God is continually bringing God's kingdom closer and closer and closer. Do we not see it? So the harsh news of Ecclesiastes is also the good news. The difficult piece of the message that I can't change anything in life is certainly not by worrying about it. Even as much as that's a harsh news, it's also good news. But because I can't change anything, God does, right? Which is, again, how is that expressed in Ecclesiastes? And God looks after what is driven away. As, as, we, you know, as we turn to the future and we can't change those matters of the past, right? God takes care of, God looks after those things of the past and makes them right. So, so we live between these tensions of wanting to control everything and make it happen right on one hand. And on the other hand... <laughs> knowing that we can't control things and that the only way to live the fullness of life is to let go and let God. Another bumper sticker, right? Now, Jesus didn't say anywhere in his teaching, <laughs> and you won't find it in the Old Testament, right, that this way of life is easy. Of course it's not. It's a balancing act. It's a balancing act in which we, we constantly have to recognize, right, recognize what God is doing and constantly doing. 
God has designed this kingdom as it's unfolding to pre, in some ways, what's the, the scholarly word that they use? Predisposed? Uh, things are likely to happen in, in the way that God organized them, right? <laughs> we can't change that. That's predisposed. And yet at the same time, we can learn it, how God's ways are, and join it. And as we do, just simply not, <laughs> not worry. So the past is driven away. This is, this is why we get the forgiveness of sins, right? Because <laughs> God doesn't care what we've done in the past. God forgives that. God invites us to be forgiving followers of God so that our focus is continually on the future as we move into, as we move into the future. Now, I know among the things that's most difficult to wrestle with, and, and I, I'd be remiss not to say just a few words more, is one of the things that's so frightening for us, and that's the actions that have happened in this last couple of weeks. Um, the experiences of suicide. I get a lot of questions that pop up, and they require more time for reflection and answers than what I'll take this morning. Um, does somebody go to heaven? <laughs> um, uh, you, you know, it, 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 what were they just thinking about themselves? How, how horrible that is. People will observe. Isn't that right? It's, isn't it just so selfish? You know, all these, all these questions about what's going on. And yet the truth is, as it's presented this morning, is we can't change what has happened. But what we can do is receive the gift of God of compassion. Not to change the past, but to live with it. To live with the past into the future. With compassion, with mercy, with forgiveness with fulfillment, with even our joy made complete, the very thing that Jesus promised in his last hours with the disciples. Even they wondered about, about him. Why didn't Jesus defend himself when he was on trial? Why didn't, if he was the Son of God, bring himself off the cross? Questions we can't answer simply but can only heed to the Scripture and find, find the one balance in life that allows us to sleep at night, to trust in God, to raise up our faith before God, that gift of faith, which offers us the assurance that in God's time and in God's way, things are made right. With that... Let's come around God's table. Because in the remembrance of our table fellowship, is that not what we are actually doing? Remembering this horrendous death. But Jesus' gift, as he was with his disciples in that last hour, helping them to be linked to the past, to be linked to the past at that table so that it would serve them in their future. Well, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another, if you'll pray with me. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let's take uh, just a moment in silence to offer our personal confessions before God. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. 
Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Indeed, it is right and proper to give our thanks and praise this day and always as we remember God's actions in the world. Ah, even, when, um, even when we were in the garden and, and had plenty but didn't know it because we didn't know what it was yet to be without. Even there, we would wonder about this, this, this feeling that God gave us to, to want to know more, to, to want to somehow see life as God saw it. And so when we turned to that one forbidden tree <laughs> and took there from that tree the fruit of good and evil and then began to see for ourselves, do you realize that that's when we first hid from God? That's when we first lied to God. That's when we first struggled with God. And God would put us out of the garden but continue to feed us, show us how by even now the toil of our brow should we have to work and raise up the food that God would still provide in abundance. And as we lived and learned, we celebrate with those who've gone before us and praise you, O oh God, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven. We praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power, We know that on the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, uh, as he was at meal with the disciples, he took bread in the midst of that time of meal, raised it up to you, O God, gave thanks, and then broke the bread, giving it to his disciples who said to them, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you receive it. Likewise, after the meal, Jesus would take cup Raise it up to you, O God, and give thanks. Give the cup to his disciples, saying to them, This is my cup of blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and in thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Spirit, O Lord God, upon us who are gathered here. Though we are many, Lord, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in union with all the world until Christ comes again in his final victory. And pour that spirit upon also the, the gifts of bread and fruit of the vine put before us, Lord God, uh, so that what we hold in our hands, Lord, may well be uh, your body and blood shed for us, uh, giving us new life and filling us. Uh, Lord, we pray these things through you who are our Father, uh, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and by the power of the Holy Spirit that reigns now and forevermore. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God now and forever. Amen. 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 And now, having the confidence of being the children of God, let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please take the cellophane on the top of your communion cups and peel that back so that we might raise bread together. For this is the body of Christ given for all. Once again, peel the second layer off, exposing the, the juice of your cup so that we might raise cup together. The cup of Christ poured out for all. Will you share with me as we pray together? Eternal God, we give thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Shall we stand and sing together our closing hymn this morning? I can't think of any better words to send you forth with than the ones we just sang. Um, you realize what we were just praying, right, through song? Take our lives, Lord God, not, not the life of Jesus. That's already been given for us. Take our hearts, Lord God. Take our bodies. Take us that as we serve and we make God's hands relevant and, and visible in all that we say and do, may the world become closer as God's kingdom all out of the mercy of Christ who helps us to let go of the past, sleep a little better at night, and move into God's future. Amen.